uh, journeying through a series called The Story. And we started last September, and it's a journey really through Bible history and God's story that he's playing out in the upper story, even as he interacts in specific events in people's lives and nations' lives uh, throughout uh, the world's existence. From creation, we journeyed through the Old Testament, and then we spent some time with the life of Christ culminating in his resurrection. And now we have just a few weeks left today and the next two where we see God building his church and taking this message of the gospel and impacting hearts and lives uh, both in time and for eternity. And so today, you know, as we, as we sit in the middle of this pandemic and we're uh, going through these different situations, experiencing it differently as individuals and as households, uh, where is the opportunity that God gives in the midst of crisis and challenge? The scripture I'd like to share with you this morning in John chapter 17, the setting for this is Jesus just uh, the night before he went to the cross for all of us. And knowing what was ahead of him, it certainly would have been very easy for Jesus to uh, be thinking more of himself and what he needed and the support he needed to go through that time of suffering. But in, the, in this time of prayer that he spends with his disciples, he prays, yes, he prays for himself uh, that, the, that his father would, would strengthen him for the task ahead. He prayed for his disciples, but he also prayed for, for you and for me and all who come to know Jesus through the power of the gospel and the, the saving work of baptism and God's grace. And what he prays is that we find a unity around Christ, our Savior. Just the, the same unity that Jesus had with his Father, he wants his people to experience with one another. And so as we think about God uh, through the power of his word and the gospel message, building his kingdom, it's his desire and always has been. It's his heart for you and for me that we're included part of his family and find a unity in him that is, that is unbreakable. And so as I read this scripture, just know that God's heart is for you and to bring you close to him and to bring you close to one another. And I know we're, we're missing that point right now, uh, the, the physical uh, opportunity to, to be together, uh, but it'll come and, and it'll be there and we'll enjoy it even more than we ever have in the past. Here's Jesus' words in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, through the disciples' message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. These are Jesus' words. This morning we're going to look at a few verses from Acts chapter 14. So if you want to pull out your Bibles, uh, pull it up on your app. Um, again, our message notes for this morning's message are linked on our live stream page on our crossandcrowntx.com website. You know, two of the words that I've, that I've heard a lot over the last six weeks, and perhaps if, if, if each one of us had a quarter for every time we heard them, uh, we, we'd all be doing all right. And those two words are unprecedented and crisis. And whether you read media, you listen to the media, uh, read blogs, listen to podcasts, etc., cetera, uh, those words come up a lot. And so, you know, reflecting on those two words of, of something that's unprecedented means that it hasn't happened before, at least to the extent that we're dealing with it now. Now, I, I get that for one person, something may be unprecedented and someone else may have already experienced it. So it's, it's a little bit of relative in regard to using that term, but unprecedented perhaps also conveys that we, we're not quite sure how to deal with this because it's something new and we don't have a past pattern to rely on. Now again, we could have a discussion whether that's the right term to describe what we're going through, but there certainly are things of our experience in our country and our culture over COVID-19 and the pandemic, et cetera, that 
are unprecedented, that we haven't experienced before or dealt with in this way before. The term crisis usually is something that is impending, that's a, a negative, uh, negative activity that, that is about to happen or has happened to us. And it, it involves perhaps some different actions than we would when we're not in crisis, and it also brings up different fears or different emotions that, when we're, that we're not in crisis. And so I put those two terms together, unprecedented crisis, I, I guess it, it's interesting in my own heart and mind, as well as just observing others, to say, well, how do we react to an unprecedented crisis? And perhaps for some, we're just kind of going with the flow. Perhaps uh, in others, it's creating a, a greater fear than we've had, a lot of uh, uncertainty. Um, we're dealing with maybe not having a job anymore when we did six weeks ago. Uh, maybe you know someone or yourself have uh, suffered from the virus itself. And so, not discounting any of the reactions or the emotions that come up, but when you think about what do I do in an unprecedented crisis, that sometimes in the midst of crisis comes the greatest opportunities, that, that I see something that I haven't seen before. I learned something about myself or my business or my work, my skill set. I, I, I learned something that if I choose to, I can build on and come out of that crisis unprecedented, but in a better spot. And so I pray that in general for us as a nation, as families, as individuals, that out of this crisis, as unprecedented as it, it may be, that we come out of it stronger and better uh, than, than we have been. That, that's truly my prayer. But I've also been thinking about this in regard to the church. Uh, obviously, being a pastor, that maybe is on my mind a little bit more than other people's minds, but just collectively around uh, our community or around our nation, what, what impact does this have on the church? And as we know, you're sitting at home, and there's a few of us here, and it was great to have uh, the Cornwell family join us this morning, uh, to, to have uh, some different faces among us to, uh, to, to celebrate the baptism, etc. But it, it seems like things are very empty, and it seems like, you know, we usually on a, on a given week have between both of our services, uh, we're not a large congregation, but, you know, 65 to 70 between both the services, and we, I think we have eight this morning. Um, and so it, it looks like, from an outward appearance, that the church is on a decline. But I think if we look at it that way, we're missing something. We're missing something as collectively as the church and individually as God's people. Because here's what we begin to realize in that New Testament church. The spread of the gospel was unprecedented. In, in the fact that no one had heard of it before, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So the, the message was very new. And you, you see also in the New Testament church that there were many challenges and crises that arose individually for the apostles or collectively for the church. It was a time of persecution. We're going to look at just a snippet from the Apostle Paul's ministry, and next week we're going to look at more. He was in prison, shipwrecked, etc. But, but here's what we see in the New Testament church. Here's, how we, here's what we see in how God works in the time of crisis and challenge. And, and this is the first truth if you're filling in the, in the blanks of your notes. God builds His church when His church is challenged. God builds His church when his church is challenged. And when you think about it, <clears throat> if everything is running smoothly, we can sometimes become complacent collectively or individually in regard to our faith life or sharing our faith. But perhaps this, this time of togetherness with your family or just more downtime than you've had in the past, I pray that you've filled some of that with spending time with your Savior Jesus. Perhaps time that you wouldn't have had if you are busy in doing the things that are regularly part of your schedule. And these are small ways in which God builds His church individually in our hearts and collectively in the time of challenge and crisis. And so let's look at one snippet where we see God building His church and also a crisis that arises, and then what happens afterwards? And, and how does God build His church, build His people in a time of crisis? And I pray that this message isn't just timely for today for you and your family, but you know what, after we get past this, and I'm confident we're going to get past the, 
this collectively as a country and as a nation, as a people and as families. But another challenge will arise. Something else will come up that maybe is unique to you or your family or even as a country. So these, these realities that God presents to us in regard to how he works in a time of challenge, I pray are, are a blessing to you today as well as into the future. So here's the setting in Acts chapter 14. The Apostle Paul is on what we call his first missionary journey. So last week we just touched on how God changed Paul's life from Saul, his name was at that time, and he was persecuting. He wanted to get rid of the Christian faith. And as he's traveling from the southern part where Jerusalem is up to the northern area called Damascus, he was there to get rid of Christians. And on the way, he encountered Christ, and he literally knocked, Christ knocked, knocked Paul off his horse, and he changed his heart from one of persecuting the resurrected Christ to one proclaiming. And God chose him with his tenacity and the, the same tenacity, vigor, and energy that he went about persecuting the church. Now he was going to proclaim Christ. And so this is the first missionary journey, and his, and his partner in mission work was a guy by the name of Barnabas. And Barnabas, um, his nickname was the, the son of encourager, the encourager. And so it, it must have been a great travel companion to have in this first missionary journey that, that Barnabas was there to encourage the Apostle Paul. And so they come to a city called Iconium. Now that's in the, the modern-day area of Turkey. Um, it was known as Asia Minor at that time. So if you can think of the Mediterranean world and the region of Turkey, Iconium is kind of in the central part of Turkey. And as their custom was, they would oftentimes find the local synagogue, the local church where there were Jewish believers, and they would pre present the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and connect it to the Old Testament prophecies and help people make that connection between what was prophesied and promised in the Old Testament where they had placed their faith and how Jesus was that Messiah, was that anointed one, that fulfilled and brought to completion uh, the work of, that the prophets had spoken about. And so as they're doing this, God uses their message to change the hearts of many people, but when hearts are changed, there were those that got jealous and those that wanted to get rid of Paul and Barnabas. Here's how the scriptures record it in Acts chapter 14, 1 to 7. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the good news. What we see in Paul and Barnabas reminds us and puts in front of us again what the main purpose of the church is. Why did why were Paul and Barnabas out there? Why did God send his disciples into the world? And that main purpose of the church is to proclaim the gospel. And gospel, by definition, is the good news, the good news about sins forgiven in Jesus Christ. This was their primary purpose. And we see that in their pattern. They would go to the synagogues and they would proclaim Christ. Whoever would listen, they would proclaim Christ. And yes, they would, they would help those. They perform miracles. They were given the ability to uh, heal those that were sick, and, and I'm sure they extended acts of love as they went about their work and their mission work. But the primary purpose was to fill people with the love of Jesus and the gospel message. Secondarily were those other acts of love that were carried out by Paul and Barnabas and other Christians. And so when we, when we think about the, this time of crisis in our country, it's given an opportunity to say, what is really the primary purpose of God's church. When we can't do a lot of things, perhaps in our communities and social interaction, etc., cetera, and, and, and helping people that way, we're reminded what, what is at the heart of what God has established His church for. We looked at that last week, with Christ as the cornerstone, is to help people and bring people to the message of Jesus. And that's what the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were doing. And God used that to change the hearts of many people after last week's lesson, we had 5,000 believers. Now we've kind of lost track by Acts 14. It just says a great number believed in Jesus. 
And so God's Spirit was at work through the power of the gospel to bring people to know and believe who Jesus was and what he's done. And in the midst of these challenges, the gospel continued to spread. You know, Paul and Barnabas could have said, when they started hearing this plot afoot to get rid of him, they could have said, you know what, we're done. Hey, Paul could have said to Barnabas and Barnabas, you know, you know, if this is the way it's going to be, I know God's changing lots of hearts and there's a lot of believers, but you know what, this, this stoning threat and these things that are coming in regard to us proclaiming the gospel, um, I don't know if it's worth it. I think we should just go back to Antioch now, just kind of hole up, retire from this whole mission work stuff. But sometimes crisis and opposition gets us to think this isn't worth it. It's too hard. It's too difficult. And we feel like giving up. And perhaps you've, you've had those thoughts in the, the time of, of uh, the, this social isolation and all that sort of thing. Um, I know there's, there's, there's times in our homes probably where uh, if yours is like ours, where it just kind of like bubbles to the top and it's like, we're done with this. We just want to go back to school and go back to our routine, etc. And sometimes there are challenges in life. They, they kind of boil it and say, we're just kind of done with this. Now, I have to admit, Paul and Barnabas were practical. They used their common sense and say, you know what, there's people here that are, want to get rid of us and want to take our life. And they had spent some considerable time in Iconium, and many people had come to know Jesus. And so instead of facing down that threat locally, they didn't give up. They just moved on, <clears throat> and they kept going in a different city, in a different part of the, the region. And so as a church, we could have said, you know what, let's just ride this out. Let's shut the doors. Let's not do anything. Let's not uh, get the gospel out. You know, it's like, well, we'll come back when it's all over. But no, God has given us this tool of the internet and by which you're uh, observing now live or we'll listen to it later. And it's like moving from, from one venue, one format to another. I'm looking forward to having people back and, and having our, our church full of people again. But for now and into the future too, there's always going to be an opportunity to share the gospel via this format. And see, this is what God does. In the challenge, as, as one individual said, the church is now, pro now producing more media than Hollywood. Hollywood production studios are shut down. They're closed. Every church in America virtually is online. You can find two or three or four services that you can take in on a Sunday morning. And the gospel is getting proclaimed in, in areas, churches that were never doing online streaming, picked up a phone and started doing Facebook Live. You see, this is what happens in the time of challenge and crisis is God opens our eyes to see opportunities to carry out the mission He's already given us, which is to proclaim the gospel. The primary the purpose of the church is to proclaim the gospel. And I pray that what, wherever and however we can do that, we never give up that purpose, never give up that mission. The second truth that we learned from this lesson with the Apostle Paul and Barnabas is what I just mentioned, but to fill in the blank, not only is the primary purpose of the church to proclaim the gospel, God uses crisis for the advancement of the gospel. You see, sometimes when we see something is so terrible and, and this, is, this is challenging and we, don't wanna, we want it to be over with, which I would agree with, in the midst of those challenges, God finds ways to advance the gospel. And we see that after this persecution in Iconium, they go to the neighboring cities of, of Lystra and Derbe, and they get worshipped as, as uh, gods in those cities. And, and eventually they finish their trip and they head back to Antioch. And, and here's the account of them reporting to the church that had sent them off on the mission work. Acts chapter 14, verse 26. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples there in Antioch. And so at the heart of the report is all that God had done and how God had opened this door to the Gentiles, to a people that had not heard of Jesus. You can understand the Jews who understood something about the Messiah and Paul made the connection and they, and they believed in Jesus as that Messiah. But these Gentiles were pagans. They, they were worshiping uh, mythology and all these different religions and practices. And God opened a door to their hearts through the power of the gospel amidst the challenges that Paul and Barnabas faced. I'm convinced in the midst of every challenge, God is advancing the gospel in your own heart, in our family's hearts, in our community, in our churches, etc. Because 
in the midst of challenges and crisis, is that not the time where our faith is challenged the most? That we have to rely on our faith and our connection to our Savior the most. So how does God do this? How does God advance the gospel, collectively or individually, in your own heart, in your own family? I'm going to point out three things. And I'd be interested, I'm going to, I'm going to list three things, but maybe there are ways that you've experienced and that you've seen. And if, if you put it in the, in the chat, in the Facebook Live, um, how, how have you seen God advance the gospel in times of challenge and crisis, whether this one or a previous one. First thing he does in advancing the gospel in a time of crisis is he refocuses his people on the purpose of the church, which we said was the proclamation of the gospel. You could maybe put it another way. He refocuses his people on the gospel, on the good news about Jesus, sins forgiven. Just a couple of days ago, we, a couple of weeks ago, we had the opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and his crucifixion and, and all these things come to mind again as we're in the middle of our challenge. What really matters most? What relationship is most important? If I would lose my life, where do I turn? You see, in the time of challenge, we think about that more. And God uses that to refocus our hearts and our minds on the good news about Jesus. And we'll see how that plays out in just a moment, but just to linger here for a bit, even as a church, that we can lose focus on taking care of business and the facility and different programs and activities, all of which I pray have an important part in regard to the proclamation of the gospel, but sometimes those activities can become more important than the gospel. And so it's an opportunity, I was reading a, a blog this week, that every church has a chance to restart and reset. And so I invite you to think about that too, to say, what, what does this look like as we come back and refocus and re-energize collectively our efforts on spreading the gospel message. Because at a time of crisis, God advances His church by getting us to refocus on the gospel and realize that not only do we need that, but also others need that. Now, why is the gospel so important in, part of the, in the time of crisis? God creates a need that only the gospel can fill. God creates a need that only the gospel can fill. Here's three needs that I've noticed in my own heart and mind and as well as in our community and in our country that I believe only the gospel can fully fill them. The first one is fear. The crisis brings fear. And that's because what we thought was stable, what we thought was in front of us, what we thought we knew is all disrupted. And especially in time of of a virus that we can't see it, we don't know who has it, to some degree, we see each other as a, a silent enemy. It's like, well, you may be carrying it. I don't want it. I'm not going to stay close to you, etc. All these things going on create this fear inside of us that ultimately we, we see on the, on the news report the number that have died, and, and my heart goes out to all those that have lost loved ones because of this and, and, and any other reason for that matter. But our fear is we're going to catch this or someone that we love is going to catch this and we may end up dying. The reality is, Each one of us is going to die somewhere, somehow. And that creates a fear. Now, how does the gospel answer that? It it brings a peace that the scriptures say surpasses all understanding. We don't quite get it. We can't quite diagram it. We can't scientifically dissect it. But it's just a settled reality in our heart. Why is that? How does the gospel bring that? Why does the gospel bring us this peace? Because it tells us my biggest problem in life, and that's my relationship to a holy, righteous God, is solved in the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's proved by his empty tomb. And if I have my biggest problem in life, and that of my sin, and a broken relationship with my Savior, solved by Jesus Christ, my heart can be at peace. Because even if I would catch this virus, and it would end in the the ultimate uh, consequence of the virus, of death, I know it's just my transition from this life to the next. That's why it's such a privilege just to, to baptize a few moments ago little Lorelai and, and to have her parents who trust the promises that God attach to baptism. Because it, it, it's the, that visible connection that God gives us and says, I've made you my child. You're mine. I love you. You're forgiven. Jesus' work on the cross is yours. His empty tomb is the new life that I've given to you. And all these blessings wrapped up in baptism and, and reminded to us in the gospel message are our biggest needs in life. 
in the time of crisis, that need comes up and the gospel fills it, the gospel of peace. So I pray that the gospel, that God loves you, forgives you, and has heaven waiting for you, lets you sleep at night, knowing that this or if something else would end your life, you're safe in Jesus' arms. The second need that comes up is around certainty. That in times of crisis, there's a lot of uncertainty, and the gospel brings certainty. It's like, what, what can I rely on? We have models that tell us one thing. We have authorities that tell us one thing. We have medical experts that tell us one thing. It's like, what can I believe? We have posts on Facebook. Is it real? Is it not? It's like, you kind of get overwhelmed with it. What is true? What is not? And the gospel message of God's love for you is, is true. It, it always has been and always will be. His promises, He's never let us down. When God says something, it's this not an expert making a projection. It's the Almighty God who is, was, and always will be saying what is. In the midst of uncertainty, the gospel brings certainty. And third, when people are unclear, the gospel brings clarity. I want to know what the future brings. Will I have a job? What will the economy look like? What will my health look like? Perhaps the unclarity creates some unrest. And here's what we know. Because the gospel says, here's what's clear. You're loved, forgiven, and heaven is yours. I'm with you always to the very end of the earth. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. That nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Neither height nor depth, neither angels or demons, neither life or death. These things are clear, are certain, and give us peace. And this is the opportunity in the midst of a challenge and a crisis for the gospel to fill your heart and your home. And third, how does God advance the, the gospel in a time of crisis? Not only does he refocus us on the gospel, creates a need for the gospel that only the gospel can fill, finally he gathers an audience to hear the comfort the gospel brings. Each one of you watching out there is evidence of this, that, that you're still connecting to the gospel message. And here's kind of the fun thing, and I'm going to throw a few numbers out, and I, and I, I, I think they're right based on uh, Tim and Jim, who are our tech crew. I asked them this week, I go, just give me, a, <clears throat> give me an idea of how many people are, are watching our live stream. And so they, they sent me that chart, and the 10 services that we broadcast, so two each Sunday, and then Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, the last 10 services for each service, we've had 27 unique uh, IPs. Now, we don't know names and faces. We just get an electronic code that says your computer logged in. I know everything's getting tracked. It's whatever. Big Brother's watching it. No. We, but it's just kind of interesting. <clears throat> so if, if we assume that perhaps on an average, there are two people in each of those households, that's about 54 people minimally, because I know you're out there who never sign our guest book and never put your name on Facebook Live. And that's okay. We're glad you're here. So we're just taking those that have given us some indication that they're, they're with us. On an average Sunday, like I said, here at Crossing Crown, we have about 65 to 70 unique people, which represents about 25 to 30 households. So now we're reaching almost double that on a Sunday morning of different households that are receiving. And I get it. Some people will log in, click on, click off. I pray they get the little gospel nugget that they know their love forgiven and, and are going to heaven in Jesus. On Facebook Live, <clears throat> again, I looked at the last 10 services. Of the last 10 services, we averaged 101 views. And again, I get it. If it shows up on your screen, you click on it, you watch it for a few seconds, that counts as a view. But some I know have watched longer. So it may not tell the whole story, but just by comparison, I went to the previous 10 Facebook Live streams. So 10 more recently, and then 10 beyond that. The average was 56 views. So almost double the viewership on Facebook Live. Almost double the attendance online. And that doesn't count those that are just watching and never let us know that you are. And that's okay. Like I said, keep watching. We're glad you're there. Would this be happening if we're not in the middle of this crisis? Or is this God gathering an audience 
that people don't have to go out of their homes and into a building to receive encouragement and connection with the gospel of Jesus. Now, I pray that when this is over, many and, and all of you gather in your local church. Uh, if you're not here in Georgetown, and if you're here in Georgetown, come visit us at, at Cross and Crown. We'd love to have you. But it just says that the gospel is being proclaimed. I hear of people who are watching two or three services on a Sunday morning. And so they're getting two to three times the gospel message than they have in the past. And that's a good thing. They're having conversations. They're coming up more easily. They're, they're having connection with people. They're, they're able to forward a service. They're able to invite someone to worship with them by sharing a link or sharing an invite to our, our live stream page. And all these are things that perhaps we weren't doing more intentionally, but because online worship is now the only option, we're seeing the opportunity that God is creating for us not just to reach our community in Georgetown, but around our country. We had 15 different states log in and a number of others. I don't know if those are from other countries around the world or whatever, but the gospel message is being heard and being seen perhaps in unprecedented ways, in unprecedented numbers. I can't back that up with numbers. I just know the numbers that reflect here at Cross and Crown. And what I see is, is more households have had the opportunity to connect with the gospel message than we're able to reach physically here on a Sunday morning. And that's pretty cool. And that's how God works. So I have a couple questions just to ask you. As you think about the opportunity that God has given you, what can you do to share Jesus with people during this time? And how can we help you? What do you need? We certainly invite you to, to forward whatever material you find on our Cross and Crown uh, Facebook page or website. Invite your friends or family to worship if they don't have a place to, to worship an online stream they're connected to. How can we help you? We have, we have visuals on our Facebook feed. You can share those. You can forward those to a friend. But maybe there's something else that you, it would be helpful to you to share Jesus in your homes, in your communities, in, in your families uh, during this time. Where are the opportunities that God is opening up for you? And then collectively, I guess I'm, I'm interested, if you're willing to share again in the comments or email us, call us, etc., what opportunities do you see God opening for the gospel during this time and beyond? Because I'm convinced that an unprecedented crisis creates an unprecedented opportunity for the gospel. It has from the beginning of the church's history, the beginning of the proclamation of the gospel. It was challenged, but in the challenge, the gospel spread. It was challenged again, and the gospel spread again. And we are the recipients of that almost 2,000 years later, of individuals faithfully taking the gospel message in times of peace and in times of challenge and proclaiming it with others. We'll get through this. God will see us through it, one way or another, and we can sleep easy in that. But as his people, as his church, my prayer is that we also see the opportunities that God is presenting to us. And with the same boldness as Paul and Barnabas proclaimed in Iconium, Lystra, Derby, and around the Mediterranean world, that we carry that same conviction the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe, for the Jew and for the Gentile, for you and for your family, for your neighbor, for your co-workers, for the world, for our country. The gospel is what hearts need in the time of crisis. And in the time of crisis, God creates an opportunity for the gospel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that your gospel message has come into our hearts and to our lives we thank you that your grace, especially this morning in the, the gift of baptism for Lorelei, we're just amazed that, that you can come in such a simple yet powerful way and connect us to your saving name. We pray that you would preserve her in the faith that you have given her all the days of her life. And Lord, as we see in this time of, of, of challenge, of crisis, unprecedented though it may be, may we see the unprecedented opportunities that you're presenting to us and our families to sit around the dinner table and have discussions about your word, to have conversations via the, the internet, via Zoom with family and friends. Perhaps the conversation of faith comes up more easily. The opportunity to invite our friends to worship with us without even leaving their homes. Lord, wherever the opportunities are, wherever the doors were open, just as Paul and Barnabas came back to Antioch and they rejoiced because the Lord had opened the door to the proclamation of the gospel to the Gentiles, may we look back on this time 
and be amazed at how you open the doors for your gospel message to be proclaimed during a time of unprecedented crisis as you showed us unprecedented opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen.